And there's still, we're talking um, some stigmas out there. It's still. Is there? Yes, there is, sir. And as we see the soldiers who come into the WTU, and um, they will say that, you know, they're reluctant to talk about their problems or, you know, their diagnosis of PTS, and, and then just have to reassure them that now that they're in the Warrior Transition Unit, we don't have a stigma. Outside of the Warrior Transition Unit, especially among lower ranks, they do perceive that there is a stigma that'll carry over to their military career or to their, you know, civilian but life. do you see, I mean, and you all are the experts, do you, it may be the feeling of the younger folks that there might be a stigma because they're new to the organization and they're feeling their way through. I think the younger people are, like, scared, sir, because, like, the, all, all the leadership, it's always mission first, mission first, and then when somebody identifies that they need help, they're either not given the time to, to go to their appointments or they're, they're put in a different category, like, Hey, you're, you're screwing up our mission, you're yeah. mission ready. You're taking that. me away from what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Right. And, and, and sometimes mm -hmm. uh, what comes with that and what right looks like, sir, in regards to that, is uh, the leadership, the senior leadership, or whoever the immediate supervisor is to that soldier, uh, them being educated and knowing what you know, PTS is, and uh, whenever a soldier uh, approaches that leader as far as what the issue is, that way that leader knows, hey, these are the avenues or these are the resources that I need to reach out to to help this soldier. Yeah. I believe that how I defeat the stigma is I earn the respect and confidence of my soldiers. Once that's established, then when I su suggest they may need to go seek some help, they do it because they believe mm -hmm. in me and not just because an NCO is telling them to do something. Yeah. Well, and I think part of that is getting back uh, in a, in when we're redeployed to these kind of settings. I mean, we, we spend a year, 15 months, nine months sitting around a table like this eating three meals a day uh, in a chow hall somewhere and we get to know our guys uh, and gals and then when we come back, we distance ourselves from each other. So, uh, you know, it's important for leaders to come back together and, and actually have that same kind of bond in, in peacetime or when they're redeployed as they do when they're deployed. So. Yeah. What's the, the, the most interesting thing you've seen in terms of this, Chaplain? Because you're, you're usually the, at least one of the entry points, if not the most critical entry point to some counseling. Yes, sir. Well, what I've seen is, um, due to the fact that everything that's said with a chaplain remains absolutely confidential, soldiers oftentimes are more willing to come to us yeah. first to get help because they know there are no records, uh, no one's going to know about it, they, it stays in that office. And it, what can happen over the course of time is, as we work with these soldiers, as we begin to talk about their issues and, uh, and how we can work towards a solution, sometimes that uh, solution involves behavioral health. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that as something that's positive, something that's not going to affect them negatively in their career, something that can really bring benefit to them and to their families. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen that chaplains work very well together with behavioral health uh, providers. Uh, that sometimes we get referrals from them yeah. that uh, the issue is really spiritual in nature. So uh, it's, it's neat to, to have that kind of partnership, uh, to know that no matter what, a, what the comfort level of a soldier is, there's someone there in his or her chain of command that can help them. What would be the, the piece of advice that you all would give to someone who's thinking that they might need help? So I'd say if they're already thinking about it, they probably need to go talk to someone. Mm -hmm. So I would say take a risk. Go ahead and talk to someone, be it your chaplain, be it your social worker, be it uh, somebody at the hospital, be it a leader. It doesn't matter. Talk to someone you trust uh, and let that person help you make the call whether you need further help. Everybody has a hesitancy going into it and they're nervous and not sure if this is going to help and that's, that's a given. I mean, but I've seen so many soldiers, warriors tell me that I'm so thankful that I did this, you know. Because otherwise, you know, I probably would have been divorced or, you know, my career would have been destroyed and, you know, it, it's saved my life and I'm so glad. But it is it's that initial step. I know I got some counseling because my wife finally told me, hey, you need to go see somebody mm -hmm. after a very traumatic incident that occurred in my very first combat tour. And had she not done that, I would have never done it. Uh, even though I saw all the same kind of advertisements and pushes that the rest of our soldiers are getting, it, had it not been for my wife saying, go talk to somebody, I would not have done it. 
I think it's not necessarily the person that's closest to you. It's just someone who says, hey, there might be something amiss. Who are the folks that should push people to get help? The one that notices the problem, sir. Yeah. Yes. So it can come from, from anybody. You just have to listen. And sir, it does take you know, a good amount of courage to do that. You know, we send our soldiers to war. We ask them to, to demonstrate personal courage there on the battlefield, yeah. to face the enemy, to not retreat. And then we come back here and we're asking them to do the same thing, to take that personal courage, to, to get the help that they need, to not worry about but what others think. It's a different think. kind of personal courage. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, sir.